But I think they're absolutely fascinating because there's a there's a real history here and there's a tale of two industries that, that we can get into. So what you find, you go to the museum, uh, Cairo Museum, and I'm sure there's hopefully there's many more of because they've got they found like tens of thousands of these. Um hopefully there's many more on display in the new museum when it opens up. Uh but What's interesting about these is that there, you have a collection of these stone vases. Now, Petrie analyzed these, and there's been a lot of work put into them by other guys like Chris Dunn and engineering studies that show they were lathe turned. Uh, they, they were certainly turned on some form of spinning tool. There was something that uh, carved them that was, that was extremely um, sturdy, that could carve extremely hard material. And then we're not talking about just granite here. It, it, granite, schist, corundum, diorite, slate, um, God, nice. There's all sorts of like, there's all sorts of exotic types of stones that these were made. Lapis lazuli, all sorts of stuff that these are made from. And they, a lot of them exhibit like really precision made elements. Again, perfect symmetry. Uh, there's some of, there's an example of one of these vases that sort of stands on its tip like it's like it's an egg. Right, balances. Like it's balanced perfectly. Uh, you have some of these stone vases that you got to remember the material, while it's very strong, is also uh, very, can be very brittle. So it snaps easily. It's kind of like diamond will, will scratch and cut things. Because but there's you, different materials in there. Well, it's like fault lines in the material. Yeah, right. there's different materials in it. But if you hit diamond, it can shatter. So it's the same thing with some of the stone. Uh, the 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 look at that thing right there. Go back. The that's so that's the vase that stands on the tip. Yeah. On, on its tip. The, so the bottom. There's no flat bottom. No to flat it. bottom. Yeah. If you if you I, if you have it, there's another angle on it where you can see it sort of standing on its <clears> tip. <throat> um, and some of the material. Of these vases gets down to like the thickness of Petri called it a stout playing card, so thin cardboard. They've they've shaved it down to that level. It's it's there's all these remarkable elements to these vases. They're they're, they're clearly the result of some pretty sophisticated tooling and 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 carving techniques. That it's it's not pottery. Now pottery is a different thing with clay, and that's used as part of um you know defining civilizations. It's we you know show me the potsherds. That's all pottery. We use and and the Egyptians use pottery. What's interesting about these vases is that they all come from the very early, according to the mainstream story, from the very earliest part of Egyptian history, and that's where they stop. They don't make any more. So the vast majority of these vases were found under the Step Pyramid of Djosa, which was the first, uh, I think the first pharaoh of the of the um, fourth dynasty. 40,000 plus of them found in the tunnels under there, all stacked up, a lot of it broken. A lot of them busted up. That's yeah, a look that's how one. thin the top of that is. Well, that's that, that's actually the corundum vase. That's that's made out of a nine on the most scale, believe it or not. <sighs> um, and all that. So, what are all those different like specks that are? There's crystal crystal inclusions. Okay, like it's that's like chunks of different material, which do make it much more difficult. Like when you're machining these, you, you're going from softer to harder material, so it makes it really really hard material to work in. Um, very challenging, and and then hollowing out the insides is a whole other deal. Um, they also have these handles, which means they weren't all turned on a lathe. They has had another tool to create the, mm -hmm. the shapes of the handles. But the history of these things is like they were all found in this one area. And then even at Saqqara in the museum, they say that it's likely that all of these vases were heirlooms from earlier dynasties, from the first or second dynasty. Because when you go back and you look at first or second dynasty tombs, we find things like the schist disc. Now, you, you know, you're familiar with this. This is kind of a notorious That's the thing. Looks like a, it looks like a propeller. propeller with a wheel around it. Yeah, there's a picture of it in here in this section if we find it. But the schist disc is a really remarkable um, um, artifact. Now, it's been repaired uh, and it's been put back together, but it's it's the, the challenge with the schist disc is in how you make it. Like it's these folded blades or wings of schist on it and it's very thin uh but they found that in a first dynasty uh tomb so the tomb of sabu a prince i think and what's interesting is that th these 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 precision objects these tiny precision objects go back even further there was one of the pictures up there, there was, it is. that's the schist disc yeah it's remarkable made out of stone single piece carved that way it's been kind of repaired what type of stone is it made it's out of? schist oh schist is the schist. stone okay. yeah it's a very brittle but it's very hard stone uh insane how that was made. There's a few really strange shaped uh, objects like this uh, that are in the museum, but you can go back into pre-dynastic times. And one, I saw the image of one of my favorite little objects there, which is a tube of lapis lazuli. Right. It's a hollow tube with a gold sheath that's been it's been tube drilled out and hollowed out. And lapis is a very hard stone. It's got a gold sheath on it, and it's in an it's in it's in a display case next to like bone and bead ornaments and like really 
See, so see the bone thing next to it, yeah, and the beads. It's like, ah, oh, look, we found this. It's in a from a pre dynastic site. It's an object that takes, you know, it's a high technology object, but we're we're right next to all these beads and bone stuff, mm-hmm. and it's just the same. It's fine. They just the same people made this. No worries. And <laughs> in fact, there's an even better example. Is there's a site, um, oh, uh, Toshka, I think it's called, and it was one of the sites that was flooded when they when they. Um, they dammed the Nile and so it was like buried, but they, they, they explored it in the 50s and 60s and there's a few photos of it at the Aswan Museum and it was and it's a, a site that they dug up. They found human remains, a skeleton, they found some pottery and then they found stone vases, like these precision stone vases and there's organic material in that burial that they carbon date back to 15,000 BC, so 17,000 years old and you still have these stone vessels in a burial from 17,000 years ago. And it's it's on a site called Toshka. So what happens is that, okay, so we've got all these stone vessels and they come down. Egyptian civilization starts first dynasty. We've got, we find first dynasty burials with stuff like the schist disc. We get up to Joza, who must have collected all of them and he buried himself with them. And then we find them. And then after that period, nothing. Like there, there is not anyone, they never make vessels like that again. What happens is that with Joza, there's a guy called Imhotep, famous um, polymath, like genius Egyptian. Uh, people may have recognized the name. He designed the step pyramid. He also analyzed these vases and he came up with a method for trying to create vases made from alabaster, which is white calcite. It's a much like a three or a four on the most scale. Okay. And there's a scene on the wall that they found at Saqqara that shows these guys making these alabaster vases with like these rotating like like little like flint chisels and stuff and them sort of manufacturing these vases. Now, this scene on the wall is exactly what the Egyptologists and all of the establishment people point to and say, see, this is the Egyptians making these stone vessels. I'm like, no, that's, that's the Egyptians making the alabaster vessels that were imitating them. And we have examples of these alabaster vessels. If you flick through this, you'll find these white vases and they're nothing like the stone vases. They're, they're imprecise. They're wobbly. They're like they're they're some of they got good over time, but they're nothing like the stone vessels. And they're far far softer material. And this is what was used for canopic vessels going forward. Keep going. That's that's granite. I'll show you when we. That's the scene on the wall. Those are the vessels, right? Okay. So those are the vessels that that were made after the time of Imhotep and Joza, and after all of these stone vessels were were basically collected. This is the type of stuff that you see yeah, from not, then on. It's not like the only way you can describe the stone vases is perfect. That's the only way you can describe them. Yeah, and these are are imperfect. These they're are, imperfect. Yeah, they're well done. They're great, and they, they the examples get get better. But it, they make an alabaster is far softer and far easier to work than mm-hmm. these other types of stone. And these were the vessels that were then used later on as you know canopic jars and stuff like that for the organs for, for the, organs for the stuff. organs yeah. of people. Yeah. What's funny is that they some of these stone vessels before. Joza and stuff they, they were used as canopic vessels too for noblemen and things but you see where they've got lids on them right yes the stone vessels didn't have lids so what they would do was the, the egyptians would make like a mud stopper and it's like this cone of just like mud it's this horrible looking thing and and they found so, and all of the stone vessels no one made lids for them so it's like well, hang on if you if you're if you're the egyptians making the stone vessels to use as canopic jars. You mm-hmm. might make a lid for them because you certainly made lids for the alabaster ones you made, mm-hmm. but there's no lids. So they have all these like stoppers uh, in the museum. You can find like these, just these clay rough stoppers that they would put this little thing on top of these jars to seal them up. And it's like proudly displayed next to the vases as like, hey, this is what they did. I've got a picture of the stoppers in there somewhere, but wow. it's just funny. It's like, to me, it's like what's what's more likely, you know, that – that they had the ability in the first and second dynasty to make all these things, uh, even when the architecture of those periods don't match any of the any of the technology that we see, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the stonework itself. Or is it more likely that they inherited them, that they found them, that you know, because these things also exist back as far as fifteen thousand BC from other burials, and we've certainly seen them on pre-dynastic sites. I think the inheritance scenario makes a lot more sense because it's. I hate these things that just, you know, you don't just lose that technological capability to make them immediately and it's just, oh, well, now we're doing imperfect alabaster work. Those are the stoppers. The stoppers that they yeah. use for the tops. Yeah. So it's I, I think the I think the vases are a huge smoking gun. And once again, um, again, they're the result of some pre-advanced um, 
machining techniques.